But the idea of pre-negotiating that and trying to do a co-op commission and then trying to find a way to communicate that out or worse, taking a thousand phone calls from buyer's agents saying, how much is the pre-negotiated commission? How much is the pre-negotiated commission? Since you can't advertise it in MLS, I think over time, the old way is going to get less and less popular and you're going to see more agents embracing the framework uh, of kind of how this was built and what this now opens up. Hey guys, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, very important video today. All real estate agents need to watch this video. Guys, with the most recent NAR lawsuit settlement, there's a lot of information going around. A lot of it's not accurate. In this video, Robert Palmer, founder and CEO of LPT Realty, is gonna go through in depth, factually, what's in the lawsuit, what it means for you as an agent, and probably most importantly, how you can use this as an opportunity to grow your business and pick up more market share. Guys, this is not business as usual. Things have changed, and once this settlement is ratified and put into action, business has changed, and you need to make sure that you have the right information so that you know what to do, know how to adapt, and can overcome and grow through this. If that's what you're looking for, this is the video for you to watch. Stay tuned. We're jumping into it right now. I, I've prepared another slide deck since this is a uh, a complicated topic. So if we can get those slides back up on y'all's side of the studio, yeah. uh, we can go on to the next slide and and we'll kind of break down. I would say the the truth of what's going on here. And you know, obviously we've seen um, seen the big headlines come out. You know, National Association of Realtors reaches the agreement to resolve the claims. I will say overall, having the claims resolved is positive. Um, you know, seeing all these different lawsuits pop up around the country. You know, this is something that was really causing uncertainty in our industry. And obviously, it's it's important that we know where we're going. All right. And so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, it just kind of, you know, this next slide just shows some of the headlines that I'm sure you've all seen. These are the things that we now have to be prepared to deal with. Uh, because again, the, the media is taking this and spinning it in a way uh, that isn't necessarily representative of of what's happening and what's in the actual settlement document. Uh, and so again, today we're breaking down, we're gonna show you language from the actual proposed settlement and, and talk about how I do think there's some changes. Like it's it's not going to be business as usual. Uh, I don't see this as being catastrophic. I don't see this as dropping commissions by 40, 50% as some of the headlines are saying, but there are going to be changes that we have to adapt to. And, and I see opportunities for agents who are willing to adapt and embrace and, and really take advantage of the new ways this creates for you to serve your clients uh, because that does exist. So let's let's go on to the next slide. So the, the key terms of the settlement, um, one, NAR announced the agreement that would end litigation of claims brought on behalf of home sellers related to broker commissions. The settlement is still subject to court approval, uh, although at this point the parties have agreed and it seems like most of the points in here would lead to a court approval. Uh, if you look at the, the Department of Justice's objections to the MLS pen settlement, which held that settlement up in one of the other cases, most of those points were all covered here. So it seems like NAR worked with the Department of Justice to make sure they were okay with this before making their big announcements. Uh, NAR continues to deny any wrongdoing, of course, and then NAR is going to pay $418 million over approximately four years. Um, if you think about the number of NAR members there are, and the amount of reserves and cash that NAR currently has, this may may result in a small increase in dues, but it, it doesn't have to be anything overly dramatic in order for NAR to hit that number. Uh, two critical achievements. This is from NAR's press release, the release of most NAR members and many industry stakeholders from the liability, and the cooperative compensation remains a choice for consumers when buying or selling a home. And that, that was important for NAR. Again, while I think a lot of the system changes make cooperative compensation less attractive, and we're gonna talk about why that is, it is still a choice for consumers and for agents. And so really it's going to give us, I think, again, more ways to serve our clients, more ways to negotiate our own commissions on both sides of the transaction. Uh, so the release of liability, this is an interesting one. So who was actually included in this settlement if it's approved? Uh, NAR was included, over 1 million NAR members and most brokerages, not all brokerages, uh, all state, territorial, and local realtor associations, and all associations owned by MLSs. So the exception is uh, brokerages whose residential transaction volume in 2022 
was above $2 billion must make an additional payment of 0. 0.0025 times the average annual volume over the last four years, or they have to enter into what's referred to as hardship negotiations via mediation. Um, to give you some perspective, if you take Compass's four-year volume times the 0. 0.0025, that number is around half a billion dollars. Um, if you take EXP's volume times the 0. 0.0025, that number is like just a little under 400 million, like 360, 370 million dollars. So the the largest brokerages still have uh, still have to deal with this. They still have to decide: Are they going to opt into the settlement and pay the 0. 0.0025? Are they going to go to this mediation and say, "Hey, we don't have that much money"? You know, Compass can say, "We don't have half a billion dollars to pay you. Look at our financials. This is what we do have." Uh, my gut says that, that the plaintiff's counsel is going to say, hey, you're a publicly traded company, issue more stock, go raise some debt, figure out how to pay us. But we really don't know what that looks like. According to NARS press release, they fought hard trying to get all brokerages included. But in the end, the plaintiff's counsel was unwilling to release basically what ended up being the top 100 brokerages in the country. And if you do the math on that 0. 0.0025, if a company's average volume was around the 2 billion mark, which was the threshold, you're looking at $5 million for them to, to add into the settlement, again, up to as much as $500 million. So there's still a lot of money in question here beyond the $400 million that NAR is paying. Uh, and then too, there, I think there's going to be some ripples inside of the industry and NAR because the these brokerages were basically not included in the global settlement. Uh, and so again, we're, we're going to be watching that closely. Uh, you know, roughly a third of the money goes to the attorneys and then the rest is spread between all of the uh, consumers who opt into the class action settlement. So, you know, you've probably gotten a class action notification in the past. You'll get a little postcard in the mail that says, hey, you know, you're a part of this settlement because you sold a home during the last four years. Here's your check for $50, $40, whatever that number ends up being, depending on how many brokerages actually settle in the end. Um, going on to the next slide. So when I really read through everything, there are effectively three really big changes that, that we need to consider as a brokerage and we all need to consider as agents. Uh, number one being that cooperative commission is no longer required. It remains optional. It can no longer be advertised in any MLS fields or any third-party system using MLS data. And I'm actually going to show you the actual language from the settlement. This is my interpretation on this slide. We'll get into the actual language behind it. Uh, and so this is big. You know, the fact that it remains optional is important. The fact that it's no longer required is interesting. It's going to change the way we do business or allow us, if we choose to, for agents to change the way they do business. The fact that it can no longer be advertised in any MLS fields. I know on social media this weekend, people were saying, oh, we'll, we'll add it to this field or that field. Uh, I believe ba you know, basic, um, based on a, a clear interpretation or a, a kind of a strict interpretation, even uploading a document, which is still considered a field of the MLS, may be a violation. And then two, there was a lot of talk of like, well, some other system will become the system of record for this. There is actually a, a clause that says if MLS finds out that any system using MLS data, like showing time, is trying to become the new uh, place for buyer's agent commission to be advertised, they have to cut them off. So we'll, we'll go into that a little bit deeper. Uh, number two, all realtors and MLS participants must have a buyer broker agreement executed prior to any touring. All right. So before the first tour, you have to have a buyer broker agreement signed. This is massive. Um, this is probably one of the most impactful changes. And I think this is actually going to be good for buyer's agents in the end because everyone has to do it, including the listing agent. We'll talk about what that looks like. So everyone now has a level playing field to get that buyer broker agreement signed up front. And here's the important one. The final compensation cannot exceed what is agreed to in the buyer broker agreement. So if your buyer broker agreement is signed at 2%, and then you sell a house where the listing agent is still offering cooperative compensation at, say, 3%, you do not get the extra point. That extra 1% has to be repaid back to the consumer because you cannot make more than what was in your, your agreed-to buyer-broker agreement. You cannot go up if the seller is willing to pay you more. So that's an interesting kind of twist. Uh, and then three, since all commission amounts are now negotiated with each party prior to the offer. So think about that. I've used this word of decoupling commissions. I had some people challenge me on that and say they don't see this as decoupling commissions. Whatever commission you negotiate with your buyer as a buyer's agent is the commission you will receive. 
So again, if you negotiate a 2% commission with your buyer's agent, and then you sell a house that's offering 3% cooperative commission, you still only get two. So the commissions have absolutely been decoupled. You have to negotiate your buyer commission with the buyer's uh, agent or with the buyer. And then the listing agent is going to negotiate the listing commission with the seller. And then yes, the seller can absolutely agree to help pay the buyer's agent's commission, but they can't pay more than what was agreed to in the buyer broker agreement. And that that's critical. That's important to understand. So again, since all commission amounts are now negotiated already with each party, the good thing here is the amount of seller contribution to buyer commission can now be negotiated in the actual purchase contract. And again, this is a big shift from where we sit today. If you represent a buyer and you don't have a buyer broker agreement and that buyer falls in love with a house that's only offering, say, a 1% buyer's agent commission, then that's what you're going to make. Under this new set of rules, you're going to have already entered into a buyer broker agreement with your buyer before the first tour, outlining your compensation. And now you need to negotiate, is the seller going to pay that? Is the buyer going to pay that? And that can be negotiated at the time of the actual contract. All right, so this is actual language from the settlement. So again, I just gave you my summary. We're going to go back to my summary, but first I want to take you through the actual um, settlement language, and then we'll get back into how I think this looks for business going forward. Uh, these are the things that that are required to be changed as uh, as practices as if the settlement is approved by the courts. Eliminate any requirement by the MLS that listing brokers or sellers must make offers of cooperating compensation to brokers or other buy representatives. So mandatory compensation is gone, still optional. Eliminate and prohibit any requirements conditioning MLS participation or membership in offering or accepting compensation. So this is the first thing. The settlement is saying no more mandatory offers of compensation and bullets I and IV from the settlement cover those. Prohibit MLS participants, subscribers, or other real estate brokers, other real estate agents, or sellers from making offers of compensation on the MLS to cooperating brokers or other buyer representatives. All right, so this is what's saying you cannot list the buyer agent compensation or the total amount of compensation in the MLS anymore. All right, and it says now the second bullet down there, eliminate all broker compensation fields on the MLS and prohibit the sharing of offers to buyer brokers or other buyer representatives uh, in any field of the MLS. So this is what's gonna prohibit people from using private remarks, public remarks, no matter what the field is called, the chat, Davey. No matter what the field is called, it can no longer have any offers of compensation or talk about compensation. So these two bullets are what actually puts that into practice. The next slide is where they're actually going to prohibit third-party companies. So the MLSs have to agree that they will not create, facilitate, or support any other mechanism from becoming the place where internet aggregators, showing time, or anyone like that uses MLS data and then adds in the uh, cooperative broker compensation. So they really tried to go through and, and make sure there were no loopholes here from the standpoint of getting compensation offers into the MLS or into any third party services like showing time. Uh, this would, in my opinion, would prevent Zillow from being able to show compensation on listings. I know there was a lot of information going around about that um, on the internet. This V here, uh, item five, from the change in behavior from the settlement is going to prevent that from happening. The MLS have to make sure that no one is using their data to create a, an alternative way to offer compensation. Uh, this is the big one. Require that all MLS participants working with a buyer into, into a written agreement before the buyer tours any home. All right. So now think about this. Even if you're the listing agent, you cannot tour the buyer on that home if you're ever going to make compensation from them without getting a buyer broker agreement signed up front. So everyone has to deal with this now. So if you think about it in today's world, uh, if you ask for a buyer broker agreement, maybe the buyer just calls around until they find an agent who is willing to show them a house without a buyer broker agreement. Now, every single agent before touring, before the first tour of any home, they have to have a buyer broker agreement signed. So again, this levels the playing field. Now, the, the consumer can call a million agents. They're going to have to commit to someone before they can tour a house. So I, I see this as an actual win for buyer's agents. So uh, if you're going to receive compensation from any source, the agreement must specify and conspicuously disclose the amount or rate of compensation it will receive and how the amount will be determined. B, the amount of compensation reflected must be objectively ascertainable and may not be open-ended. You can't write buyer broker compensation shall be whatever amount the seller is offering to the buyer. You have to have an actual percentage 
or it could be a percentage plus a flat fee. So you could say 2% plus $500, 4% plus $1,000, but you can't say whatever they're willing to pay me on the sell on the sell side. So again, they really wrote this trying to close the loopholes to provide a new way uh, for this to happen. Uh, and then C, MLS participants may not receive compensation for brokerage services from any source that exceeds the amount or rate agreed to in the agreement with the buyer. So whatever that number you agree to with the buyer, if you find a listing that's offering a 10% commission, you can't make that 10% uh, because of what you agreed to with your buyer. The other interesting thing here, and we're going to see how the final rules are written, it says from any source. So our other sources, like maybe maybe you you recommend a home warranty company and make some money there. Maybe you recommend an alarm system company and make some money there. We don't know until the final rules are written if, if those types of compensation will be limited as well to the maximum amount that was set in that buyer broker agreement. So again, this is the actual language from the settlement talking about the buyer broker agreement and, and how that's going to play out now in the future. There is still obviously some things to be determined in the rulemaking by NAR, but this is what the settlement actually says when it comes to the buyer broker agreement. And the big things here are before the first tour, that's massive, not just before closing, not just before writing an offer, before for touring, if you're ever going to make compensation from them, right? Uh, and then from there, we go into it has to be objectively ascertainable. You can't write whatever they offer me on the sell side is what I'm going to take. Uh, and then you can't make more than whatever was agreed to in that original buyer broker agreement. So those are three big shifts. Even for states that have mandatory buyer broker agreements today, this is a change. This is a shift for most states. They don't have this stringent of a buyer broker framework. Uh, NAR has to rescind or modify any existing rules that are inconsistent with the practice changes reflected in paragraph 68 of the settlement. So policies like Article 1616 will need to be rescinded or modified since commissions have already been negotiated and there is no longer a mandatory cooperative compensation. So for those of you that don't know, the reason you cannot uh, negotiate commission in a contract today is because of this uh, standard of practice 1616. This is a clear example of one that will have to be modified or rescinded under the new framework because there is no longer mandatory buyer agent compensation, which is, again, going to create a situation where agents negotiate a commission with the listing agent, a commission with the buyer's agent, and then the final negotiation is, will the seller be helping pay any of the buyer's agent's commission? So it really is three negotiations, right? Listing agent negotiates the listing uh, commission. The listing agent can choose to pre-negotiate a contribution to the buyer's agent. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. And then the buyer's agent negotiating the commission with their buyer at the time of the buyer broker agreement. All right? And I have not seen any language that says you can't reduce your commission, only that you can't increase it. So if your initial buyer broker agreement is signed at 4% and you end up only getting two because the buyer short class of funds, whatever, that's okay. On the flip side, again, from what we see today, on the flip side, if your buyer broker agreement is signed at two and then someone's offering four or five, the extra uh, is not going to be able to go to you under the rules and the way they're written. So again, the three big changes. And again, I'm gonna keep going back to this slide as we go through the presentation. So again, I showed you the actual backup, the actual language from the settlement. These are my three bullets of how those changes all come together. Cooperative commissions no longer required, remain optional can no longer be advertised in any MLS field or third-party system. All realtors and MLS participants must have that buyer broker agreement subject to very strict rules executed prior to touring, and the final compensation cannot exceed what's in the BBA. And now that commissions are already set, the amount of seller contribution to buyer commission will be negotiated separately at the time of the purchase contract or potentially pre-negotiated by the listing agent. But I actually think that can cause some problems and we're going to talk about why. So on the next slide, uh, I want you to ask, uh, I want you to ask yourself this question. So with all of these changes, the big question is, while it's still an option, should you pre-negotiate a cooperative commission with your seller? If you're a listing agent, under the new rules, right? In today's world, you absolutely have to negotiate both your commission and the cooperative agent commission at the initial listing appointment. That is how it works today. Is that the best method moving forward? It is still an option. And again, as entrepreneurs here at LPT, this is your choice to make, but I'm going to tell you my views on it. And, and so what you need to think about is, does it make sense to pre-negotiate that commission when one, you can no longer effectively advertise in the MLS, so other agents aren't going to know what it is to motivate them or not motivate them. 
the amount listed in the buyer broker agreement will limit what you can make regardless of what is offered. So regardless of what you as the listing agent offer, whatever's in that buyer broker agreement is going to be the max that the buyer's agent can make. So you may have 10 different offers come in with 10 different potential commission rates if the buyers have negotiated different amounts. But if you've pre-negotiated a commission, does that still make sense? And then now that your seller actually has the power to decide any seller contribution to buyer's agent commission on a case by case basis for each contract. I want you to think about how powerful this is. This actually gives, in my opinion, agents more, more uh, flexibility in how deals are put together. Instead of pre-negotiating a commission, the seller would now have the choice to look at the commission in each different offer and decide which offer is best, which offer is highest and best. And that's not always going to hinge on the commission rate. So the seller experience. I kind of just alluded to this. There's basically two ways as agents you can think about this. The listing agent can pre-negotiate a total commission. You can go on that listing appointment and say, you know what, Mr. Seller, 6% commission, three for me, three for them, 8% commission, four for me, four for them, whatever it is, very similar to today's situation. Or the listing agent can make a choice to negotiate only the listing side of the commission at the listing appointment, but then prepare the seller that there will be requests to contribute to buyer's agent commission in the future. I want you to think about how that negotiation goes. Hey, Mr. Seller, all I'm gonna do today is have you agree to pay me as your listing agent two, two and a half, three, four, five, seven, whatever that percentage is. But I do want you to be prepared that when the offers start to come in, some of those offers are going to ask for us to contribute to the buyer's agent's commission. And together, you and I are going to look at each one of those offers and we're gonna make a decision for the one that is best for you. Which one sounds like a more powerful position to come from? If agent A goes in saying, hey, give me 6% and whatever, and agent B goes in and says, hey, commit to three today, and then we're gonna see what the other side asks for as the offers come in, I think there's an opportunity here for agents who choose to embrace the new framework to have a competitive advantage over other agents. Now, again, we're not saying don't pay buyer's agents, right? A buyer agent agreement may come in asking for 10% commission. We don't know what it is, but the key is you're going to make that choice with your seller as the offers actually come in instead of pre-negotiating the commission the way we do today. Now, guess what else that does? When the seller says, hey, Robert, I just saw a CNN headline that said real estate commissions are no longer 6%. You can say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm only asking you to sign for 3% today. Now, we don't know how much we're going to have to pay the other side. We'll find out as the offers come in, maybe it's still 6%, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 7%. I don't know. But yes, at, at today's signing with me, before the change, I would have asked you to sign a commission agreement for 6%. Today, I'm only asking you to sign a commission agreement for 3%. And then we're going to determine the other side's commission as the actual offers come in. To me, that is a much more powerful position to put yourself and your client in as a real estate agent. All right. So let, let's look at two examples of this. So you list a home with a $450,000 asking price and you do not pre-negotiate the buyer's agent commission. This is option two. Two offers come in. The first offer is 450,000 and that buyer signed an agreement for 4% commission with their agent and the agent is now asking your seller to pay the entire 4%. Your seller would net $432,000. A second offer comes in at 430,000 ask and that buyer signed a buyer agreement at only 2% and again they're asking your seller to pay the commission. Offer one nets your seller more money. Had you pre-tried to sell your seller on the commission, you probably wouldn't have landed at 4%. You probably wouldn't have landed where you are. But now you can look at each offer individually and determine what's best for the seller. Let's look at on the next slide that same scenario with a pre-negotiated commission. So now you have a pre-negotiated commission. You said, you know what, Mr. Seller, I'm going to do it the old school way. You're going to go ahead and sign today with me for 6%, 3% to me, 3% in cooperative commission. We can't advertise that. We can't tell people about it. But when offers come in, just be prepared for that. And now our same two offers come in. So now on offer one, you have to have, which is actually the better offer, you have to have a tough conversation with your seller and say, well, I know I told you I thought it was going to be 6%, 3% for me, 3% for the, the other agent, but this agent's asking for 4%. So we're going to have to do an excess credit to pay the difference in buyer's agent commission, but you're still going to net 432000 
on the other offer that comes in that's only asking for 2% because you pre-negotiated 3% to that agent and that agent can't keep the difference because their buyer broker agreement is only for 2%, the buyer is actually going to get the $4,300 back as some type of rebate, which is then potentially going to cause problems with their lender because that may be an excess concession. So again, there's a lot of things to think about here where while the old way is still an option, all right? And again, I'm not telling you how to run your business at LPT. We will support you no matter with which method you choose, as long as they're state compliant and legal. I just see where the old way is going to cause some problems because now that buyers are negotiating the commission at the time of the buyer's uh, broker agreement, if that is lower than what you pre-negotiate, you actually are hurting your seller. And if it's higher than what you pre-negotiated, now you've got an awkward conversation with your seller. So again, I think over time, we're going to see less and less agents pre-negotiating that commission. Now you absolutely need to prepare your seller for it. You need to tell your seller, hey, this 3% you're paying me, that's not the end of the day. There is going to be most likely some other commission you're going to participate in. So impacts of the settlement. This is important. Um, FISBOs and builders. And I've seen a lot of questions about this in the chat, and I wanted to wait till we got here to talk about it. So FISBOs and builders, one, they've already shown us how markets will behave because FISBOs and builders never had mandatory cooperative commission. They, they never had all of the things that are now being eliminated. And you always had to negotiate any commission contribution from the FISBO at the the time of offer. And then builders were going to put out their numbers and maybe some builders pay higher, some builders pay lower depending on market conditions. I want you to think about a world where all buyers are under a buyer broker agreement. That should say buyer broker agreement, not BAC. Sorry, wrong, wrong acronym there. Every buyer is under a buyer broker agreement. And so if all these, these buyers are already under a buyer broker agreement because they've already started touring houses, to me, that's going to take away some of the builder's power to suddenly slash commissions in a hot market. Because if all if all of the consumers are already under a buyer broker agreement at a certain percentage, the builder's going to have to either turn those people away, tell them to come out of their own pocket, or they're going to have to continue to pay what is in line or contribute what is in line to help those buyers pay the commission. So I think that the buyer broker agreement existence is actually going to help agents when it comes to working with builders and obviously with FISBOs, because you're going to see more of those uh, proliferate around the industry. The other interesting thing now is agents have this new power to negotiate the seller contribution to buyer agent commissions at the time of offer. That's probably one of most powerful things that's coming from all this because you already negotiated the commission with your buyer now you are free as a part of the contract to negotiate how much the seller is going to contribute to help pay for that because you're not negotiating the commission the commission's already been negotiated with your buyer and even if the listing agent pre-negotiated a commission for you that's irrelevant because you negotiated the commission with your buyer at the time of the buyer broker agreement. So again, these dynamics are changing. As much as people wanna say nothing's changing, these are changes. Now, you can do business the old way. I don't see this, I'm not a sky is falling guy. I see opportunity here. And I really wanna encourage our agents to take a hard look at, do you wanna embrace this or do you wanna keep doing it the old way? Again, LPT is gonna support you either way, but I wanted to share our perspective. When someone does call you and say, hey, how much is the co-op commission? Because this is gonna happen, right? It's no longer in the MLS. You're going to have buyer's agents calling listing agents saying, how much is the co-op commission? How much is the co-op commission? If you pre-negotiated a co-op commission, you're going to say, oh, it's 2%. Oh, it's 3%. Maybe you scare some offers off, right? You say, oh, it's 2%. And that guy says, well, my buyer broker agreement is for three. You know, maybe that's not going to work for my buyer. My recommended response to you is, my seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission. Please submit with your offer. You're not turning any way, not, not turning anyone away. You're not presetting any type of commission levels. You're not discouraging agents who maybe do have a higher buyer broker agreement. You're literally telling them, hey, submit your offer. Tell me how much you want. I'll present it to my seller. And again, make sure your seller is willing to entertain all requests. Maybe some won't be. My gut says most will because they want the highest and best offer they can get. But this is how I would explain it. My seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission. Please submit with your offer. And my hope is that we can actually put that language in the MLS we're not sure yet. The way the rules are written, it's ambiguous. My hope will be that we can put this in the MLS because this is not an offer of compensation. This is a willingness to accept requests for compensation. So again, my hope is they let us put this in the MLS, but if they don't let us put it in the MLS, when you answer your phone and someone says, how much is the cooperative commission on this house? You say, basically, whatever you need it to be. My seller is willing to entertain all requests for contribution to buyer's agent commission. 
Please submit with your offer. This will get the most offers in the door. This will give you the best opportunity to work with those sellers. And again, this is some of what I view as the power of this new decoupled system. All right, so the, the power of the new buyer broker agreement. To see a house, you will have to sign a buyer agreement with someone. Right? Any realtor, any MLS participant, before they can start touring homes from you, if they ever hope to make a penny off of you before the first home tour, has to have you sign a buyer broker agreement. Even the listing agent, because they are most likely an MLS participant or realtor, you may see some like open doors or people who purposely leave NAR membership uh, because they don't need the MLS and maybe they don't want to have to comply with this. But most people are going to uh, comply with this. And most people are going to have to get that. I mean, when I say most, I'm saying 98% of all business is now going to be done with a buyer broker agreement. To me, this gives the buyer's agents more control over negotiating compensation than today's system. Again, today, if you don't have a buyer broker agreement and you go to a house that is paying a low commission or no commission, you're kind of stuck. In the new world, because you can negotiate your commission rate upfront with your buyers, you're going to have more power. The other thing is it's going to kick out a lot of the looky-loos. If someone is just trying to use you to show them a house because they plan on writing the offer with their brother-in-law or their friend or whatever, they got to sign a buyer broker agreement with you now before they can get in the house. You're going to know that consumers are actually committed to you. You may set a threshold and you say, you know what, for my business, I, I don't have time to work with any buyer who won't pay me a 4% buyer agent commission. And you get to make that choice up front and put it into your buyer's agent agreement. And maybe there's some maybe there's some consumers who say, hey, I'm going to go shop for the best deal. Great. Find that out up front before you waste your time putting them in, in your car and driving them all over the place. This is going to give you more control of running a stable business as a buyer's agent. So now when it does come time for this contribution to buyer's agent commission, right? So you have a buyer broker agreement. Let's say it's hypothetically signed at 3%. Oh, need to go back a slide. We skipped one there. Um, you have a buyer broker agreement signed at 3%. And now it's time to ask the seller to pay that commission for you so that your first time home buyer or your buyer doesn't have to. Uh, the way I think about it, there's basically two methods to do this. One, I, and these are both terms I made up. One is what I'm calling the direct commission payment method. And this is where I would say, I would think you would attach your buyer broker agreement to the offer and say, dear Mr. Seller, as you can see, the consumer has, has agreed to pay me a 4% commission. They would like you to pay that on their behalf. Uh, are you willing to do this? And again, the seller is going to either accept or reject that offer. When you use this, what I'm calling the direct commission payment method, this doesn't count against financing concessions, and this is completely allowable on VA loans. All right, this is exactly how FISBOs work today. When you go to a FISBO and the FISBO agrees to pay you a commission, VA does not count that in the max 4% concession. VA allows the seller to pay a commission to whoever they want. Uh, so this doesn't hurt your financing in any way, but the con of this is it does expose the commission amount to the seller. Maybe you see, uh, maybe you talk to a listing agent and they say, my seller is not paying a dime of buyer's agent commission, so don't even ask me for it. Well, guess what? Option one is now off the table unless that person wants to reconsider. The second way is to ask for an overall buyer cost concession and then use part of that to pay your commission. So again, let's say you're doing an FHA deal where the max concession is 6%. You have a signed buyer broker agreement at 3%. The seller told you they're not paying any commission. You can still go in and say, hey, I'd like you to pay 6% toward my buyer's closing costs. And then your buyer can use three of that six to pay your buyer broker agreement and the other three to pay some of their closing costs. You may have to negotiate with the lender a little bit on junk fees or whatever. But this, again, gives you as a buyer's agent more flexibility in how you negotiate your compensation and then how you ultimately get the seller to pay that compensation. So the pro here is it doesn't expose the commission amount at the offer. So if the seller, for whatever reason, just does not want to pay buyer's agent commission, fine, make a seller concession instead, but you as the buyer's agent can still get paid. The con here is in this method, it would count against the financing of seller concession. So you have a choice. So now when you're going to make those offers, you can look at both sides of the coin and determine what's going to be best for you getting your buyer's offer accepted and earning the compensation that you already negotiated under your buyer broker agreement. So when you're ready to submit an offer, personally, I wouldn't even call the listing agent to ask if the seller wants to pay any commission or if there's a pre-negotiated commission. I would just submit my offer, include my buyer broker agreement and say, hey, my buyer needs you to pay this amount. They don't have the funds. That's a part of our offer. You can't do this today because of rule, NAR rule 1616 because the commissions aren't already negotiated. 
Uh, and now you can only make what's in your buyer broker agreement. So to me, the, the offer of cooperative commission at this point is irrelevant. You've already agreed to a commission with your buyer. You have the right to ask the seller to pay that full amount. Why do you even care what the buyer broker you know, co-op commission is? I wouldn't even ask. I would just submit my offer and, and make it part of the negotiations. So the big question remains. We've seen this slide a couple of times. While an option, should you pre-negotiate a cooperative commission with your seller? The more we talk about this, the more we show you again. My goal here is to just expand your mind, expand your way of thinking. LPT is not here to tell you how to do this, how to run your business. We're here to support you with education. We're here to support you with recommendations. We're here to help you think bigger and think differently. But ultimately, it is your choice as an entrepreneur. Next click. Uh, it's ultimately your choice as an entrepreneur uh, as to how you want to approach this. There we go. LPT, agent choice. You are going to get to decide which of all these different methods you want to use. Are you going to pre-negotiate commission? Are you going to submit uh, under a, a request for direct commission payment? Are you going to submit under a closing cost concession? You as agents have all of these choices into how you're going to do business. And LPT is here to support you. Uh, real quick, I just, I just want to point out, like I've been down this road before. Back in 2013, I was in the mortgage business when TRID was first announced. TRID took effect in 2015. At the time, I saw a lot of mortgage companies fighting TRID, looking for loopholes, trying to do it the old way. Myself and some other mortgage companies made a decision to embrace TRID, to try to find the ways to help our clients and our company win under the new framework. And it was a massive win for me. It's a big part of how I created the company I created, created the wealth I had. And so I see an opportunity for us to do that together now here. Uh, we actually, when we embraced TRID at the time, the industry was saying, oh, it's going to take 60 days, same type of nonsense media headlines. It's going to take 60 days to close a loan now. No one will ever get loans closed. Homes aren't going to happen. Uh, I closed the first trade loan in 10 days. It was such a big accomplishment. We hopped on a private jet, flew down to the closing. I attended the closing in person. My point here to you is embracing change for me was a massive part of my success. And that's why I'm talking to you today about how I envision your ability to embrace this change and create wins for yourself. Uh, you'll notice four of the faces in this picture on the next slide. Uh, Steve Dickman, Lewis, and Matt Hodge were all on that jet with me 10 years ago when we flew down to celebrate that first trade closing. Uh, again, the leadership team here at LPT has been together for a long time. We've been through this together before. We've been through this in other industries, and we are here to help guide you through it and to help challenge you to think bigger and think of creative ways to create those wins. Uh, at the time, forms were another big part of this. So when, when this all changed, the good faith estimate went away with TRID. The, the, the industry made up this new quote sheet, which is, here's an example of one. It was a super ugly document. I made a decision to go a different direction. I'm a marketer. I decided to make good looking documents. Next slide. And this is something we're going to do for you here at LPT. We're now going to get into the tools that LPT is going to create for you. Again, following the roadmap I used for TRID a decade ago. So while the rest of the industry was using the documents on the left, my company was using the documents on the right. My picture, great graphics, still met all the regulatory requirements for, di for disclosing the information to the consumer, but it made us look good. It made people feel better about accepting the new information. And so we're going to take this again. This is stuff I did a decade ago to prepare RP funding for TRID. I'm now going to show you the previews of some tools that we've been working on to do this exact same thing for LPT agents so you can stand out when it comes to getting that buyer broker agreement signed. And you can stand out when it comes to getting that customer relationship up front so that they can do business with you. Next slide. TRID forced my customer relationship to start with disclosure. Before that, we didn't have to get documents in people's hands at the very beginning. Mandatory broker agreements is doing the same thing. Our job at LPT is to make this as simple and effective as possible for both you and your consumer. And that's a responsibility we're going to take seriously as your broker. Make this as simple and effective and attractive as possible for you and your consumer to get through that new upfront buyer broker agreement and get committed to each other and do business. Next slide. The new LPT buyer broker agreement system is going to be customizable, easy and convenient, mobile friendly. You'll be able to deliver through email, SMS, or print. You know, we love print. You can initiate from mobile and execute on mobile. And you as the agent will decide what level of information to include in that sales process, in that sales presentation to get your buyer broker agreement signed. Next slide. Now, you know this stuff's going to look good because you know everything at LPT is going to look good. Uh, a new home buyer packet. This is the new printed bound magazine. The buyer broker agreement will actually live in the back of this and be perforated. So you can give them the magazine, walk them through your value proposition, get that buyer broker agreement signed in person, and then tear the perforation out of the back, 
take a picture of it, upload it to LPT Connect, and you are ready to go. While everyone else is handing out ugly black and white forms, you are going to make a marketing presentation as a part of getting your buyer broker agreement signed so that your customer can understand your value and understand the benefit of working with you as an LPT agent at what is a difficult time getting a document signed up front. And we will customize the documents to be state compliant that are in the back of this magazine that can be torn out. Another way that LPT agents will have an unfair advantage and show up differently. Next slide. All right, as much as we love our print, we want to have an amazing online experience too. This online experience can be launched from inside of LPT Connect. It will be desktop or mobile friendly, and you as the agent will customize what that journey looks like to getting the consumer to sign the buyer broker agreement and reviewing your packet on a device. Next slide. So you'll see here on the left, there's a couple of different options. You decide which of those tabs are present. We've put some examples here. Why work with an LPT Realty agent? My pledge to you. Best practices for house hunting. Resources available to you. Buyer broker agreement. Privacy policy and broker disclosure. Signature. It's an easy to use wizard modeled after a TurboTax style integration that allows the consumer to go through this process in an understandable way that helps position you, create and show your value and give them access to easily sign the documents they need to be signed. Next slide. The cool thing here is you decide which of those tabs on the left actually show up. You may say, hey, you know what? I just want to send the buyer broker agreement. I don't want to do all the other stuff. No problem. You'll be able to set that setting inside of Connect. And when the link goes out to your buyer and the link can go out via text message, email, you decide how to deliver it. It's instant. And for some consumers, you may have them look at all of these resources. Other consumers, you may just put the buyer broker agreement in there and be done but they can e-sign it online inside of our system instantly. You guys can be doing this on a hood of a car. You can be doing it while you're driving to that first appointment. We are giving you the tools to put the buyer broker agreement and all other relevant information to build that initial relationship in the consumer's hands as absolutely easily as possible with a click of a few buttons inside of LPT Connect. Now, this was originally supposed to be part of LPT Connect 3.0, all right? We, we just announced LPT Connect 2.0 at our conference, which is all about connecting you to each other. We are actually already working on and planning 3.0 and 4.0 for release in the future. This buyer broker agreement system is one of the things that we were building in the Connect 3.0 that we are bringing back now to launch as soon as possible to have it in your hands before the deadline of when these changes take effect. Really exciting system. We are not going to replace dot loop. We're still going to use dot loop for contracts, state specific documents. We are purely building this system for the initial point of contact, the initial sale, the initial disclosure, the initial buyer broker agreement. All right. So really exciting stuff coming out here. Next slide. So recap of that, LPT Connect Buyer Broker Agreement System. Agent can easily launch a sales presentation with an included buyer broker agreement. You can update negotiable items in real time for the client. So if you send that that, that out at 4% and the client's on the phone and he says, hey, I don't think four is fair. I think it should be three. You update three and connect, you press push, the client refreshes and boom, it's updated in real time. We are building a real time collaboration system for you to get your clients through this BB, this uh, buyer broker agreement process. Instant delivery via SMS, email, or you can hand it to them in print. Agent decides which screens are included in the flow and the software will allow the least friction possible for getting a buyer broker agreement signed. This is gonna be a huge advantage for LPT agents as these new changes come into play. We're also launching buyer power tools. All right. We've had listing power tools for a long time. Listing power tools was all about positioning you on the listing side, which again is now more important than ever because agent consumers are more likely to try to negotiate more of the commission. Commission negotiation is now a hot topic. So having listing power tools is more important than ever, but we're also now bringing buyer power tools to the table, which will be more magazines, more collateral information, that integrated buyer broker agreement system in print, everything you need to show up like a rock star and win in the new world order. Uh, here's some other great views of that. Again, you guys know what our magazines look like. You know how impactful the printed collateral is. We are going to take that to the next level on the buy side because it is now more important than ever that you show maximum value to the buyer at that all important time when you're not asking them to commit to you through a buyer broker agreement. Uh, there's going to be a new buyer box in development. I'm not going to talk too much about this today. 
Uh, it's probably going to have a tape measure with an LPT logo on it in it uh, and some other cool stuff. But again, we're looking at ways to give you that shock and awe box, that package that you can hand to a potential buyer as you are meeting with them before that first tour and getting that buyer broker agreement signed. We want to make sure that you have the absolute best tools to show up like no one else and win in a market that is shifting and changing. Next slide. So LPT Realty, your brokerage for life. Uh, we take less commission, which in the event that commissions do compress is going to be more important than ever. We are actually nimble and actually be able to bring information like this to you in 72 hours and already have amazing tools in the works that we can pull up a whole year in development path and get in your hands in time for this deadline. And my commitment to you is that LPT Realty will pioneer tools to help agents protect fair commission rates on listing and buying transactions and help you show up like no one else and win in absolutely any market. There's always opportunity to win. And, and again, here at LPT, we're focused on making sure we we find those opportunities, we maximize those opportunities for our agents. Uh, that that's that's the role a brokerage should play. You know, we're we're not we are not here to find you customers. We are not here to do a lot of things that you as an entrepreneur have to do. But these are the types of places where a brokerage, in my mind, has a responsibility to help its agents by empowering your real estate business at a higher level. And we do that with marketing. We will do that with guidance. We will do that with training. We're going to do that with Connect 2.0. We will continue to rise to the occasion. That's just, it's who LPT is, man. It's it's why we're here. It's why we're different. It's why we've grown faster than anyone in history ever has before. And why we'll continue to win and change this industry because we will we will always cast off the old ways and look for ways to help our agents win. All right, guys, hopefully you've got a much better idea now of what's in the lawsuit, what it means for you as an agent, and what are some things that you can do to use this as an opportunity to grow and not get left behind. Like I said at the beginning, you can either adapt and overcome or you can get stuck in the old ways and get left behind. Those who can adapt and overcome are going to move forward through this and are going to use this as an opportunity to grow. I hope you were able to see that the kind of leadership we have here at LPT Realty is prepared to do just that, is prepared to adapt, overcome, and help us as agents grow. Guys, if the brokerage that you're at, the broker that you're working for is not able to clearly and concisely explain to you what happened, what it means for you, and pave a path forward of how you can use this as an opportunity to grow your business, I'm afraid you might be following the wrong leader. Guys, if you're interested in LPT Realty after what you've seen here, you like the kind of leadership that we have, you like some of the things we've got going on here, and you want to learn more, schedule a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom call down uh, in the description below. You'll find a link that allows you to do that. I'd love to connect with you, learn more about your business your goals, what you're trying to do, see if LPT is going to be the right fit for you and if I might be the right sponsor. I look forward to uh, seeing you guys on a Zoom call and in the next video. And until then, be well.